I'm Gabriel Kramen. I'm at Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and uh, I'm also very excited to be part of the Center for Brain, Minds, and Machines. Uh, we're very interested in studying the problem of uh, inference from partial information, how we can uh, understand the whole from its parts. So this problem manifests itself uh, in um, almost every aspect of cognition. Uh, from our ability to make social uh, inferences in, in a conversation with someone, the ability to imagine a story from just a few printed words, the ability to understand and, uh, and recognize a song from somebody who's uh, humming a song, for example. Uh, and we study this uh, problem of uh, inference from partial information in the context of visual recognition. Uh, we're particularly interested in visual recognition because we're beginning to elucidate uh, the neural machinery uh, underlying vision and because we can stand on the shoulders of previous giants who have uh, paved the way to understanding uh, the computational process of uh, vision. So making inferences from partial information, the so-called problem of pattern completion, uh, is an ubiquitous aspect of vision in the real world, uh, where you typically are encounter objects that have either poor illumination or shadows or other forms of blurring or uh, more uh, specifically uh, visual occlusion where you have to recognize objects even though you can only see 10-20% uh, of, of the object because all the rest is uh, heavily occluded. So this uh, story started a few years ago with work done by uh, Han Lin Tang and Bill Lotter, two talented uh, grad students in the program in biophysics at Harvard and two CBMM alums. And what they did was uh, uh, record physiological activity in the human brain while subjects were doing pattern completion. So typically we cannot interrogate uh, activity inside the human brain. All the invasive studies, all the ways to look inside the brain are mostly focused on work in animal models such as macaques and rodents and so on. The vast majority of work in humans is essentially involved in looking at the brain from the outside. So in order to look at the human brain from the inside, what Han Lin and, and Bill started was collaborate with uh, neurosurgeons who implant electrodes inside the human brain for clinical reasons. So these are patients who have epilepsy, they have pharmacologically intractable epilepsy, uh, meaning that current drugs uh, don't uh, quite work. And then uh, they put electrodes in order to localize the seizure and the seizures and functionally map uh, where uh, the epileptogenic tissue is. The patients stay in the hospital for about one week, and during this one week we have the unique opportunity to directly interrogate the activity of neurons or clusters of neurons in the brain. So we recorded the activity uh, along the ventral visual cortex, part of the brain that's fundamental for visual object recognition. So what uh, they discover is that we, even though we have uh, heavily, we present heavily occluded objects, uh, there's a visually selective response, but this selective response to heavily occluded objects is significantly delayed by about 50 to 100 milliseconds with respect to the same signals uh, uh, for fully visible uh, uh, objects. So we conjecture that this uh, additional cost, this 50 to 100 milliseconds uh, additional uh, timing required to recognize uh, occluded objects at the physiological level uh, could be implemented in the brain by recurrent connectivity, by the addition of recurrent loops on top of the purely bottom-up uh, pathway involved in visual recognition. In came uh, Martin Schrimpf and together with uh, Bill Lotter they took uh, computational models of uh, visual recognition, most notably deep convolutional networks that are purely bottom-up models that have been quite successful in recognizing fully visible objects, and they endowed that network with recurrent connectivity at the top of the pathway. So we have a pathway that has multiple layers, and at the top layer, they in included uh, recurrent connections. My name is Martin Schimpf. I'm a graduate student in the lab of Gilbert Kremen at the Boston Children's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. The way current systems in computer vision perceive the visual world is in a very feedforward manner. This basically means that when they see an image, such as a water bottle, they will immediately tell you what the object in the image is. So in this case, they would just say bottle right away. This works in simple settings, but in more challenging settings, such as occlusion, where you only see a part of the image, this becomes much harder. So current systems um, become unconfident in what is going on in the image and they might get it wrong and say this is a whale instead of a water bottle. When humans perform this task, they're really good at it. So even if I occlude 
most of this water bottle and you only see the top lid, then we'll still be able to infer that there's a whole bottle hidden underneath it. Certainly you would not think that this is now suddenly a whale. So in our study, we looked at what was going on in the human brain and specifically the whistle cortex. And we found that when humans look at these occluded images, it takes the brain longer to come to an answer. So we tried to incorporate this into a model and we built a recurrent model with attractors, which basically means that the model, just like the human brain, gets to iterate multiple times over the problem and gets to think harder about what is going on and only then it will output an answer. In neuroscience, most previous studies only looked at the very simple settings of visual object recognition. So there's no distortion, no occlusion in the images. This is one of the first studies to really look at a much more challenging setting for the human brain and how it is handling these things. At the same time in the machine learning community, current models in computer vision are only feed forward, which means they only get the single pass at the image. We're proposing a model that is recurrent, so it gets multiple passes, it gets to think harder about what is going on. We're using something called a Hopfi network, which is an approach from the computational neuroscience community. So far it hasn't picked up that much traction in the machine learning community, but we are one of the first studies to show that this attractor-based approach could work for much more challenging problems. The way this works is that we train the neural network with the whole objects as attractors. For that, we're using a learning rule that's actually inspired by the human brain called the Hebbin learning rule. What the training does is essentially it sets the weight of the neural network, and then when these occluded objects are coming in, here was list as dots, they will at each time step be given a small nudge towards the whole objects. So over time, as the occluded objects converge towards the whole counterparts, classification on top of that then becomes much easier. When the brain perceives these occluded images, um, then it actually takes a much longer time to come up with an answer uh, as compared to when it only sees a whole object. So for instance, when you see a whole object, the brain might only take 150 milliseconds to decide that it's a bottle or a chair or whatever. Um, but when this object is then included, it might take up to even 250 milliseconds. Another cool thing that we found is that when we show these occluded images to humans for only a small amount of time, you can still recognize them. But then when we show this patchy noise mask afterwards, it feels to you as if you almost saw nothing. So your classification performance is pretty much at chance. And we can actually reproduce this effect in computational models, where just like in humans, we show the occluded image and then we show this patchy noise mask. And just like humans, they suffer a severe drop in performance. What's also cool about our approach is that it's basically a drop-in technique. So if you're a computer vision researcher and you have your feedforward model, which is good at whole objects, but now you would also like it to be good on occluded objects, then you can essentially put our technique on top, train it on the whole objects, and then it should be much better than before on the occluded objects as well. This work has two major contributions. One is in the field of neuroscience, where this gives us a better understanding of the human visual cortex and how it behaves in more challenging settings, such as occlusion. Um, and perhaps in the future, this could yield towards uh, treatments for people that are impaired in these areas. On the other hand, this also now gives us a better model for computer vision. So if you want to go back 10 years, or however many years ago, you had a picture of your favorite car taken, but it was halfway occluded because there were people standing in front of it. And you want to find that picture. Current models will probably have a hard time classifying that image as a car because it is occluded. But with our model, you could now go back and, and find that car picture again and dwell in your memories. This was inspired by work done by John Hopfield in the 1980s, where he showed that he can take recurrent networks that are all to all connected and build what's called an attractor network, a network that has fixed uh, attractors, where uh, if you start with incomplete patterns, essentially the dynamics of the network will bring you onto those uh, attractors and therefore help complete patterns and do pattern completion. So we implemented this idea in these computational uh, bottom-up models by adding the recurrent connections and then we directly compare the computational results with the behavioral results as well as with the physiological results. So one of the goals uh, in, 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 in this uh, domain is to try to link what David Marr and Tommy Pocher refer to as the three levels of analysis, that is in this case physiology or the hardware, and then computation uh, and, and the mechanisms with the behavior. So here in this uh, study, we try to link all three of them and try to have a computational model that could describe what's happening at the behavioral level, how we're able to make uh, inferences, and also at the physiological level, that is the internal machinery, the neural circuitry that's responsible for visual object uh, recognition and pattern completion. There's still a very long way to go. Uh, we need to add uh, recurrent connectivity at multiple levels of the pathway, not only at the very top. 
There are many other cues that are also important for pattern completion that we haven't taken into consideration. One of them is uh, stereo, the ability to have uh, some notion of 3D information. Uh, another one is the relative position of different objects, which is also important to understand that an object is uh, occluded. And then general contextual information uh, that may also be very important for uh, visual pattern completion. Extrapolating from the results uh, in, in the domain of visual pattern completion, uh, we hope that one day some of these ideas may also be useful uh, in understanding how inference from small amounts of information uh, can be used in other domains of uh, cognition, not only for recognizing heavily occluded objects, but also for making inferences in social interactions, in the context of stories, uh, in the context of other aspects of intelligence.